everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I'm so thrilled to be here with you in this moment. I'm Carrie Washington. Um, it's an honor to be sharing this profoundly important moment with you all, this moment in our country's history and democracy that is so vital. And I'm truly honored to be joined by our vice president, the first Black Vice President, the first South Asian Vice President, the first woman to be Vice President, Madam Vice President Kamala Harris. What a privilege to be with you. And also to be joined by Vanessa Gonzalez of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and Tiffany Muller from End Citizens United and the Let America Vote Action Fund. You, these women, I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I probably don't have to tell most of you all, but their organizations and organizers across the country have been working tirelessly to protect the freedom to vote. So I'm deeply grateful to be in your company as well. Um, if I can just say briefly, democracy is a word I am so passionate about. It's a word, a concept, a system of governance that I think we have taken for granted. And um, it's just I think it has been very easy to believe that you can fulfill your obligations to a democracy by voting once in November, every four years. Um, I think it's too easy to think that once you cast the vote, that work is left up to those people in those buildings, on those hills, the people we elected. I think it's too easy to think that the right of every American to vote in free and fair elections exists and that it's there for every American. That is not reality. That's not how democracy works. Democracy is not a spectator sport, um, as, as my dear Howard Zinn used to say. Democracy is laborious. Democracy doesn't work without you and your voice. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I just want to say that I share in the passion of all of the, the activists and organizers on this call. The ability to vote in free and fair elections, as you know, as I know, is under attack. Legislatures across the country have already passed dozens of voter suppression bills with hundreds and hundreds, this is not hyperbole, hundreds more bills introduced. So what we're doing here today is saying, we need you, we thank you, and we need you. We need you to acknowledge and act on your role in this moment, to know that we the people means you, uh, that this is it, this is our democracy. Um, I know that we're exhausted, we're still exhausted from the 2020 election. Um, I know that we're exhausted and reeling from this pandemic that we're in that is taking too many lives. And I know that there is so much uncertainty around us, but that's what we do. We show up, we show up, we engage, we act. Um, and many of us do so by being so inspired by the endless work that Madam Vice President Harris has done. So I wanna toss to you and say that we're so honored to have your voice at this critical, critical moment. Thank you for your time. I know you have so much on your plate. Um, so let's dive in. I, I, I would love for you to give us some context and talk about the current moment from your perspective, what's yes. at stake and how does it affect our lives? Thank you, Carrie. Well, first, let me say it's just wonderful to be with you. And, and I want to thank you for always using your platform um, in a way that is about a voice fighting for social justice, fighting for civil rights. Um, Tiffany, Vanessa, thank you both. Um, the work of the Leadership Conference, the work of Set and Citizens United, I mean, since from, for, forever, but I will talk on this issue that certainly since 2013, when the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act with Shelby V. Holder, you and your members and all of who you represent have been out there fighting and fighting and fighting. And sadly, this is the latest iteration of this fight, but you all always show up. And so I thank you for that because it's tireless work and you do it with great courage. Um, you know, Carrie, I'll tell you, I think everything's at stake right now. Mm. Everything's at stake. Uh, you know, we talk about democracy and for some it's an elusive concept, what does that mean? But it truly is, to your point, it is about we the people, it is about all the people, it is about the voice of the people, it is about whether we have a government and laws, um, that represent the will of the people, that, that meet the needs of the people. Because when we're talking about voting and voting rights, if you think of, of democracy that includes uh, respect for the rule of law uh, and, 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 and free and fair elections and voting, um, these are the hallmarks of a democracy, meaning a government system and a republic or a nation that actually invests power in the people. 
And what we are seeing, to your point, around the country, especially since Shelby v. Holder, so this has been happening for almost a decade, reaching a crescendo right now, are laws being passed in states that are designed to make it more difficult for people to vote so that they don't vote. And I say a crescendo, meaning that I think the 2020 election had a lot to do with what we saw happen in just the last year and a half, which is that more people than ever before turned out to vote. People organized, they registered, they stood in lines for hours, and they used the power of their voice through their vote. And it scared some folks. And in particular, the kind of people who don't like when the people say, I want to raise the minimum wage. When the people say, mm -hmm. I'm gonna vote because I care about the environment, I wanna bring down greenhouse gas emissions and know that we will invest in a clean energy economy. When the people say, I wanna extend the, the child tax credit because I believe, as we did in the first year in 2021, that we need to and can bring down child poverty in America by almost 50%. The people spoke about what they wanted and some of the things that the people wanted and got threatened other people in power. And so, you know, I'm just about truth talking right now. Let's have real talk, right? And so what you see are laws that have been designed and certainly have the effect of targeting African-American voters, Latino voters, Asian voters, Native American voters, student voters, voters with disabilities. What you see are laws being passed. I was just in Atlanta, Georgia this week. Laws in, like in, in Georgia and in, in many other places, many other states that make it a, a crime to give people who are standing in line for hours to make it a crime for, to give them food and water while they're standing in line. R rules and, and laws that are being passed that are reducing, if not eliminating, drop boxes. Why is that an issue? Well, let's say you are a mother or a father, a single parent, let's just say three kids, and you got them in the back seat and they're cutting up, you don't have time to stand in line for hours to vote, but you know how much you have at stake, including the child tax credit. So mm -hmm. we have things like drop boxes so that parent can fill out their ballot at home and then drive by, the kids are still in the back seat, drop it off and keep going. Vote by mail, voters with disabilities. Does anyone, you know, do, do people who, who are supposed to be in a position of leadership understand what it takes for someone who is in a wheelchair, for example, to be able to get out of their house if they don't have a specially equipped automobile, the cost of getting one if there aren't free ones available, to then go to the polling place to be in line for hours? Mm. And so when we talk about our democracy and the connection between that concept, that ideal, and voting, the question becomes, are we placing the power in the people or are we taking their power away? Mm. And that's what is at stake right now. Mm. And that's why I say everything is at stake. Because, you know, I, as vice president, I have met with more world leaders than I can tell you, presidents, prime ministers. I have been traveling around the world really and virtually. And what they are doing is looking at us and asking, is the United States of America still a role model mm -hmm. for what a democracy aspires to be? I purposely said aspire because I also will not say that we are perfect, imperfect though we may be, flawed though we may be, we have the ideals that are still those of a democracy. And the strength of our democracy is we fight to achieve them. Mm -hmm. But right now, world leaders are looking to ask, is, that, is there an erosion of that fight and those principles in the United States? And if so, how can we talk to other countries about human rights abuses, aut autocracies, if we, in our own country, see an erosion of the rights that have been invested in the American people? So everything is at stake. Oh. And this is not a time to do anything except really, you know, listen to the words of Coretta Scott King, I'll paraphrase, but she said, the fight for civil rights 
and I'm going to include in that the fight for democracy must be fought and won with each generation. And I think what she meant is that these fights, the gains we make will never be permanent. So we have to be vigilant and we cannot afford to be despondent or despair or throw up our hands when we must roll up our sleeves because it's the very nature of it that anything we gain for the most part, we cannot, to your point, take for granted. We have to be vigilant in maintaining the rights and in particular the rights of the people. Oh, I love we can't throw up our hands. We have to roll up our sleeves. I feel like on a Friday night, that's what so many of us <laughs> need to hear. We just need to be reminded that that although this is a fight, that we have to stay in it. Um, yeah. Thank you so, of course, you so beautifully and truthfully articulated the context of this moment. Thank I'm you. so, so grateful. I want to ask Tiffany a question that I know when I when I listen to you, Madam Vice President, talk about um, all of these changes, all of these bills, the, the not being able to get food and water, the no drop boxes, the um, the no voting by mail. I think you know there have been unprecedented an unprecedented number of bills introduced, new laws passed. Many of them have a lot of the same types of restrictions from state to state. So Tiffany. I'm wondering, is there some kind of coordination behind these efforts from your perspective? Well, first, thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you for your leadership and your partnership during this fight. You are a true inspiration. You use your platform to educate so many on the urgency of this moment. And we are more grateful than we can say. And Madam Vice President, I am fired up after listening to you. And I wanna thank you for your tireless leadership and work on these issues. You know, uh, something you said earlier this week has been kicking around in my head all week, which is that future generations are going to ask us not how we felt during this moment, but rather what we did. And so it sounds like we're going to roll up our sleeves is what it sounds like we're going to do. <laughs> and Vanessa, we're always so honored to be here. Uh, such stalwart partners. The Leadership Conference is incredible. But Carrie, you're right. We are absolutely seeing a coordinated attack on our democracy from so many angles. First, we saw disinformation and the big lie lead to January 6th. But since then, we've seen an unrelenting attack over the past year. The 49 states that had over 400 laws, so many of those bills that looked exactly the same from state to state to state. 19 states that actually passed those bills into laws. And as the vice president was saying, things like limiting vote by mail, limiting uh, early voting, taking away drop boxes, targeting souls to the polls, and yes, making it illegal to hand out food or water to those waiting in line. Now, the vice president said this in her speech earlier this week, these laws could impact up to 55 million voters in 2022. And they disproportionately target black voters, brown voters, young voters, and voters with disability. But that's not all, that's not all. We have also seen this is a redistricting year and we have seen some of the worst racial gerrymandering in our history. And throughout the country, we are seeing partisan election officials put in place the infrastructure needed to actually overturn future elections. That's not a democracy. And these attacks are all being funded by tens of millions in dark undisclosed money. Actually, last year we saw a leaked video from Heritage Action where they were bragging about how easy it was to go from state to state to pass these bills. And they haven't stopped. Like, Carrie, just this week we saw five bills introduced in Arizona to make it harder to vote and 16 bills introduced in Virginia to roll back voting rights since the Republicans took over the governorship and the state house there. That's why we have to act now because we're truly at the most critical moment our democracy has seen. And the Senate can act to stop these attacks. They can pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. Uh, they can do it tomorrow, as a matter of fact. And that would put in place national standards so that no matter who you are, no matter where you live, you have the same access to the ballot box and your voice and your vote counts just as much in our democracy. 
And that's why here at In Citizens United and Let America Vote, I know our 4 million members are fired up and they represent the majority of Americans who want to see this bill pass. And so for all of you joining today, first, thank you for being in this fight with us. Thank you for taking time out of your Friday to join us. But guess what? This is a tough fight, like the vice president said. But we're not going to run from tough fights. We're going to roll up our sleeves and we have to redouble our efforts right now. We need every single one of you uh, to call your senators again and to urge them to pass this bill. Because together, I know we can do this. So it's such an honor to be with you all today. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you for urging that action. There's so much action we can take, being part of this community, staying informed, reaching out to your senator. These are all actions that have real, real implications, make a real impact, and reminding our elected leaders that they work for us. We pay our taxes. They work for us. Um, so I, I, I want to really thank you. Vanessa, I want to ask you specifically, um, Really, how do you, from your perspective, how does misinformation and, and disinformation that Tiffany talked about, how does it harm communities of color in particular? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think this is an issue that often kind of goes undercover. Mm. And so let's talk about it. So first and foremost, thank you, Carrie, for using your platform and your voice. So appreciate it, Madam Vice President. This is a great way to end the week. So thank you. <laughs> it's been a hard week. Um, and of course, Tiffany and the team over at ECU always appreciate your partnerships. Fantastic. Um, so the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, in part of our work, is trying to unearth what is this mis and disinformation. We know that young people, and we know the majority of young people, are Black and Brown young folks coming into this new space. We know that uh, they're turning 18, right? It is, as has often been called, the Browning of America, if you will. Y'all remember that phrase. Um, and so, what we know is that young folks are often on their phones. I mean, I think we always make jokes about it, right? You're walking around and you can see everybody just staring down at their phones. <laughs> we know that that is also where a large majority of the population gets their information and it's through various social media platforms. Now, here's the problem with that. Think about when you go home for holidays and your uncle is saying something that is just, you know, is incorrect, is totally off the wall. But because that's your uncle, you give him the grace, you give him the hug and you move on with your day. Right. It is that without the familiarity of knowing someone. Right. It is misinformation. It is intentional. It is being spread. It is feeding on the confusion that people already have within the larger systems. So as we talked about democracy, democracy is a very real thing. Democracy impacts people's lives daily. But it's really easy to say, you know, as you started, Carrie, democracy is something that, okay, I voted, I'm done. I'm out. I'm done with my part of the pie. And that's not the way this works. Mm -hmm. So if you mix that, right, and the ideas that people have a democracy, and they're living their day-to-day -day lives, we know people are working shift work, they've got more than one kid, they're just running around, right? And what that looks like on the day-to-day. -day. And then you throw in a big layer of fabrications, misinformation, or you even tell people, hey, you know what? Actually, your polling place has moved over here. And that's not true. That frustration is just going to re result in people not voting, not wanting to get involved, not taking those next steps forward. And what we know is because so many people turned out and so many people stood up and said, okay, we're here, we're gonna fix this democracy and really want to live into democratic ideals, that dis and misinformation machine just kicked up tenfold. And we know it is, again, very intentional towards young black and brown voters, young potential voters, as well as voters whose primary language may not necessarily be English. Right. And so it's really just a disgusting way to prey on people and to take advantage of how much little time folks may have in their day to day to sit back and sift through it all. And so it can be very, very dangerous. And so we are really asking folks to be mindful about where you're getting your resources. Sometimes maybe an uncle is right, but always go back and double check that that information <laughs> comes from a reputable source. Right. So you have in Citizens United, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Make sure that you're really going to people who 
you know, we do sit down and we do go comb through all of this information. We want to make sure that we are providing the most accurate information we can so that folks can continue to easily engage in democracy. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, Vanessa. So helpful to hear that from you. Um, listen, I want to be really respectful of everyone's time. So let me say that uh, I, I want to toss to you, Madam Vice President, to help us understand how people can help in this moment. But I, I just want to add, it's really been so inspiring to listen to the three of you. I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing day after day. Um, you know, I was going to say, Many of us on this call, you know, maybe we don't have to worry about losing the right to vote because of the privilege that, that many of us may experience. But in reality, when I hear about the story you told, Madam Vice President, I, you know, I rely on my right to vote by mail because I do have three kids oh. cutting up in the back seat. I don't know if you have a camera in my car, but I have three kids <laughs> constantly right. cutting up in the back of my car. And I have parents who are older and at risk for COVID. And so the right to vote by mail was so necessary for me this year to not expose my kids who were not vaccinated at the time last year, right? To not expose my parents, to not expose myself. We're still in that pandemic. Um, this is such a historic moment, not only because our democracy is being threatened, but also because voter suppression is interwoven into our history, right? Black American men didn't have the right to vote until 1870. Right. Women, not until 1920. People over the age of 18, not until 1971. This has right. always been our fight, right. right? Voter suppression is our history, but so is stopping it. Um, and when we don't engage, we run the risk of letting people who are threatened by the power of the people make decisions for the people. And we have to make decisions for ourselves. Right. We have to hold our sen senators accountable. Everyone's talked about that. So I I'm, I'm really grateful that, that we've shared that information that we, I hope everybody joining has been inspired. And I just wanna ask Vice President Harris again, thank you again. And also, you know, ask, can you tell us what you and President Biden are, are doing to get the Senate across the finish line? And, and how can the people on this call help you? What are other ways that we can help you? Great, so um, for, first let me just to further contextualize what, what I know we all know. Um, when we talk about democracy, we, I think all of us should agree and do agree, a democracy is strongest when the largest number of people participate. And one of the most clear ways to participate in who your government is, the policies, the, the priorities is, is through voting. So let's start with that. A democracy is strongest when the largest number of people participate. And we're not telling anybody who to vote for, but just participate and voting is one way. So then let's also talk about empirical evidence. To your point, Carrie, during the pandemic, there were many states that got very innovative around how can we make it easier for people to vote given the constrictions around the pandemic elderly voters and you know people stay you know how can we make it easier for people to, and actually it caused a system to kind of accelerate making it easier for people to vote because there was this emergency and guess what we saw when we made it easier for people to vote more people voted Okay, so what's wrong with that? Mm. Nothing. Mm. <laughs> what's right with that? Everything. Mm. When we make it easier for people to vote, we now have empirical evidence, more people vote. And that is the evidence that is the basis for knowing the motivation for these laws. They're making it more difficult for people to vote mm. with the hope fewer people vote. Right. It's just pure logic. So that being said, on the Senate, I, I, you know, one of the things, and, and we've talked about the speech in, in Atlanta this week, I think it's very important that we, you know, I'm a former, I was in the Senate for four years. And, um, and like every member of the Senate, I took a vote, a, a, an oath to, to support and uphold the Constitution of the United States. And, and, and what that means, the spirit of that is to uphold what it stands for, right? Now, speaking of the Senate, in 2006, there are 100 people in the Senate. 
When it came time to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act to extend protections for voting rights, the vote was 98 to zero to extend it. That means everybody in the Senate, Republican and Democrat, who was there voted in favor of extending it. A short few years later in 2021, the Republicans refused to even debate the extension of the Voting Rights Act, much less to indicate that they would vote for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. And I say all that to say, part of what this movement has to be is to not absolve the 50 Republicans who are currently in the United States Senate from their responsibility. There's been a lot of, you know, it, there's been a lot of attention to a, a specific two people but I'm not prepared to absolve the 50 Republicans mm. who took an oath to support mm. and defend the Constitution of the United States. And so part of what I would urge everyone to do is to recognize that when we think about our advocacy and when we think about how we're thinking about who is responsible for what. Every member of the United States Senate took that same oath and the history tells us that the vast majority of senators, every time this has come up, has been in favor of it. What changed? Mm -hmm. We're still talking about our democracy. So I would say that. I will, I will tell you, the president and I are very clear. We are not giving up on this. You know, so, so I'm not going to get ahead of the vote that's happening next week. Um, but I will tell you that this is why, you know, I'm so glad we're doing this today. I've been convening folks and talking with folks and calling folks. And we're doing that around the clock and we're not going to stop and we're not going to let up. This is too important. And as far as I'm concerned, there is no moment that is more important than right now, as history will show us, than to measure who anyone is in terms of their supposed role of leadership and to then ask them, where do they stand at this moment on this issue? And that, and that is exactly what we were talking about, which is, you know, in my speech, I said, you know, years from now, our children, our grandchildren, they're going to look in our eyes, each one of us, and they will ask us, not how did you feel at that moment? They will ask us, what did you do? What did you do? And so we all must act and roll up our sleeves and, and be vigilant and know that we're fighting for the strength of our country and the people. Um, and the people, all the people. Mm. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Vice President Harris. Thank, thank you, you so much. I, I mean, we're, we're just so deeply grateful that you're here. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, yeah. Vanessa. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, everyone who joined us today. Really, everybody call your senator, but even more so, the research says that if I go online as Kerry Washington, if, if Madam Vice President goes online as Madam Vice President, and we say, do what you've got to do, people won't listen as much as they will listen to their friends and family. So right. every single person in this convening, you have so much power to influence your circle of friends and family. And each person that you talk to has so much power to influence their friends and family. That's what democracy looks like. So keep the keep telling people to take action. You have so much power in this moment. Don't let anybody make you feel otherwise. Everybody go enjoy your Friday. And I look forward to being in these trenches with you guys for as long as it takes. Bye, everybody.